So, small thing up our ear. So, in all of our thinking over the last five years, we've come to the conclusion, time to get to the root of the problem and start thinking about how to extricate the automobile from our city. So, we've probably lost much business places over the kind of like this. Maybe even... The civilized world. <laughs> the civilized world. Dreams or imagine of making places like this in our hometown. But instead, we're spending our infrastructure money on things like this. So, we're here today to start talking about how to start reversing that process and doing something with this so that there's room for what we're all wanting. So what we're talking about when we say cultural revolution is that what we live in, in North America especially, and also in the Western America and most of the world, is car culture. Our whole culture is, is revolving around the automobile and this idea of private space. And that's how we've lost our car. The car, well, we can try to explain it, but it's probably best to let them do it in their own words, as the, the, the TV commercials that they're constantly bombarding us with. It sounds not so good, just listen to the best you can. Also, I feel like this world hurts. Liberty and the pursuit. <laughs> pursuit. Thanks, Colin. <laughs> That's always a sacrifice, though. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so you see a little bit of our car culture, what we have here. But we have to think about how are these cars sold to us? Mostly they're sold to us by ideals, the idea of freedom. Right? The car offers me freedom. It means I can go any place I want, any time I want. It means I have total control of my life. I can leave my parents in a small town and come work in a big city and I can get everywhere I want, whenever I want to. <coughs> freedom, is it? Freedom when you're trapped in good luck. Freedom when you're lost into, into financial debt, paying for your car for the rest of your life and insurance and gas. Freedom, he says, while you're stuck in a little box and you see a pretty girl across the road and you can't even get to see to her because you're stuck in your traffic and you have a little box. That's what you want to say, baby! <laughs> and freedom for all the little children getting trucked around from one place to the other because the streets aren't safe for them to go out and play and have friends. Freedom, hey? Well, they say it's not safe. Right? Because the car is a very safe place. That's where you got to have a nice, big, tall vehicle. People like family people, especially like a big box in the vehicle, because it's safe. It gives you that feeling of safety. So, AC like traffic accidents. Oh, and you like your nice big SUV because it makes you feel safer. You're higher up, so that if you get in a crash, it's the other guy that gets hurt, not you. That's safety for you, maybe. Uh, there's also, uh, okay, maybe that's not such a nice safe place to be in the middle of the night as you're going into your safety of your box. But if you had to choose, where would you feel safer? A street full of people and culture? Or in a lonely, creepy, dark parking garage? Well, uh... And I got another thing to say to you about safety. That it's not just about your personal health, whether you're going to get less maimed than the other person when you guys crash. But we're talking, when we're talking safety, we're talking health. We're talking about our, our ecosystem. We're talking about the entire planet. And the more cars we have, the less air we've got for the rest of us to breathe. Now I'm in our future. Take China, for example. It's uh, until recently it has about 8% car ownership per capita. And our automobile marketing firm has realized that it's a very untapped market. And they're pushing aggressively automobile sales all over there, selling them with the same words that you are. 
And so already in the last 15 years, uh, car ownership in China has gone from 1 million to 20 million. And according to the, uh, the calculations of the automobile industry, they're aiming for by 2020, 150 million cars in China. And that's in one country. That's not what they say. Of course, I'm so safe. What are they protesting in their own uh, space on their way to work? Because you have to work lots of times now. You have to work. Some people work 40 hours, 60 hours a week. But that's how you get happiness. Right? Happiness is having a car. When you're 16 years old on the prairies, what do you do? You got your car? It's a license to Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, it's happiness. You control the music, you can see rock and roll clubs you want. You can go for a long drive in the country. It's happiness. <laughs> yeah, what a myth that turns out to be. I mean, it, 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 it causes personality disorders. It turns completely nice, normal, sane people into freaks. <laughs> yelling and screaming maniacs. Just happened to get to the market where uh, a cyclist in a car never gets an altercation. This doesn't fit the GM place in the world. Well, I think it started because the cyclist actually tried to have a conversation with the car driver who was trying to hide out in his little box. Ah, oh, convenience. You can forget convenience. One of the pillars of our society. One of the pillars. Time is money, after all. And so convenience means more money, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no. Right? So is, is that what they're renaming um, rush hours? Convenience hours. Rush hours. Convenience hours, <laughs> yes. That's and right. You have your own private car. So you spend a good hour uh, to get home. And the 401 convenience way, where everybody <laughs> looks like they're waiting in the line for the, uh, the yeah. drive-thru or the donut shop. Well, it's, it's a good warm-up. Thing. It's a good warm-up for your ass so that you can watch TV when you get home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What can you do, though? How convenient? Like, what, what a great time spending. It is convenient. Spending time with mechanics, with cops, with insurance guys, instead of having fun in the world. Cheap and efficient. Can't argue that. Cars are cheap, right? Anybody you can get a car. Next one. You can get a car. They, they, they make it easy for us. Zero percent financing. All these kind of deals. The banks are helping. Everybody's helping because it's our right. It's our right to each own our own vehicle. Yeah. It's a right that was yeah. fought for in countries. All even the Germans fought for this right. The not the well, okay, they, they were not so popular for other things. <laughs> but the Nazis thought everybody should have a car. They get you hooked. Is they can get Nice, cheap, 0% general financing. They know you're hooked for life, but your monthly payments and your insurance, the whole shebang. Else for that one, didn't they? What are we got? Oh, the we're not talking about the cost of the car here. Every single thing that we have, every single part of our automobile infrastructure is subsidized by each and every one of us. And uh, I don't know how many cyclists feel that they're paying for cops to be driving up and down the freeway, check, chasing people for speeding and taking care of accidents. And there's so much infrastructure built around taking care of the automobile. The roads. What about all the hospitals where people get sick from air pollution? And let us not forget... How costly is that? Bombing well, I mean, Baghdad so we can get cheap oil. But that's good for the economy. <laughs> right? There's lots of jobs making bombs and making missiles to the defense system in the back and lots of jobs in the auto sector. Come on. Right? We need jobs. You've got to have a job. And that's kind of what we're talking about is where you put your money. What's your, what are you investing in? Sex. <laughs> Cars are sexy. Come on. Driving a car is so sexy. Everybody knows that. <laughs> Don't we think so? <laughs> so it's the automobile. I think we've convinced our car salesman here. <laughs> Oh, come on. You think that was a car still in shock? <laughs> Humanity has to get out of our boxes. And it's up to each and every one of us. It's not, um, well, the government's going to take care of it because they're more uh, deeply embedded in perpetuating it than anybody with subsidies and spending and policies and, and where we invest our public money. Um, so that's we're, we're not pointing fingers. And who's to blame? Yes, we are. And <laughs> right but, um, but also, there's no one person or one organization, the government or the activists, that are going to that are going to fix this problem for us. We're talking a cultural, societal problem. 
mental shift on a societal scale. So that means it's up to all of us, each and every one of us, your neighbors, your friends, and that's why uh, that's why I think we're here to convince you that you're all the activists. Even if you wouldn't, you've never thought of yourself like that before, in being part of this cultural shift, we're all activists. Yeah, it comes down to not just an idea of redesigning a street so that people can walk down it more easily or, or promoting pedestrians and anything like this. The context is, if somebody told you, hey, there's an army coming from another country and they're going to destroy the fish in your lake. They're going to destroy your agricultural land. They're going to pave over it. They're going to ruin your neighborhoods and your cities so you won't even know your neighbors or your families. And they're going to destroy your breathable air. The three things that you need to, to, to live. Air food and water. If somebody told you that there was an army coming in that was going to do that, people would all band together and do everything they could to stop it. Well, it's happened on a little more insipid way. It's happened culturally over the last hundred years. And that's exactly what's happened. So when we're doing our work, if you're a school teacher or if you're a, an urban designer or a planner or you work for the city somehow, it's wartime. Our very survival is at stake. And we need to take action now and not in 10 years, not in 15 years, not in 15 years. As we're fond of saying, Athens is on fire and England is underwater. It's kind of fraction now. So, and, and even if you had the thought, I mean, there was, there was a time not too long ago that we never would have that title. There was a time not too long ago when we didn't even know each other. But here we are five years later, and we can't our story. Speaking of that, though.